Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our first ever CFR training webinar for the 1920 fiscal year consolidated fiscal report. Uh, we are very excited to be presenting in this fashion and being able to keep the trainings going, even though they're normally in person. Uh, I hope everyone is staying safe and that you also get some useful information out of these webinars over the next few days. Uh, we have approximately 500 uh, attendees spread throughout the, all the agencies that require C CFR that are attending today. Um, my name is Ken Glenmire. I work for OPWDD, and I will be the host for the three webinars we have scheduled this week. Um, today's panelists will be as followed. Um, representing OASIS is uh, Paul Green and Paul Sutton. Uh, representing OMH is James Shelker, Michelle Chalinski, and Kathy Katz. Uh, representing OPWDD is uh, Francis Vasilio, Alpa Min, and myself. Uh, representing DOH is uh, Jeffrey Nickerson. Um, please note that representatives from um, the State Education Department will not be present at these training sessions and information regarding SED programs will not be covered. Uh, SED is encouraged, file, SED encourages file, filers to view the CFR online training modules located at the RIT setting units website. Also, because this is a, our first CFR webinar, um, training series. We really would appreciate if you guys take the time to fill out the post survey after you leave the event. It will help us make these trainings better going on. Some of the goals of this uh, training are going to be to introduce providers to the CFR manual and also the CFR software. Um, this so a goal will provide New York State agency contact information for specific questions not covered during this training. We'll also be uh, helping providers become familiar with the CFR core reports. Um, and we we'll also discuss important policies, principles, and rules regarding completion of the CFR. So this is important. Um, because it's a webinar, you, you guys have the ability to ask questions. Um, there's a Q&A function within the webinar itself. Um, we will not address these questions during the presentation, but we will respond to each question shortly after the end of the presentation. Um, for everyone that's, that's joining, um, the, the Q&A should be on the right-hand screen. Um, where the, the panelists and attendees, and there should be a Q&A button where you have to press an arrow to pop up. Some of the, the providers have already asked questions. Um, if that, that function isn't available for you, there might, you might want to try the more options. There's a little bubble at the bottom of your screen. There's a more options, and if you click that, you could click um, Q&A, and that should allow you to, to access that Q&A function. Um, we will be um, we will be answering these questions, just not at this current um, webinar. So what we'll do is we'll take all your questions and we'll provide answers, and we'll post this at a, a to be determined location um, in the future. Uh, another important topic um, is due to the current pandemic, we have uh, added a new schedule to help us understand. Uh, the impact that COVID has had on each provider. Uh, this schedule is called COVID-19. Uh, after this web webinar has been completed, I would uh, recommend scrolling through the presentation to slide 296 and reading through the section. On the third session this week, on July 30th, uh, we are encouraging questions to be submitted ahead of time as we have built time into the webinar to address any questions that has been submitted regarding the schedule. So after this webinar, webinar, read through this section and submit any questions you might have to OMH's email address, which is cfr at omh.ny.gov. So I just, just want to reiterate on that one. So we have a new schedule, COVID-19. Um, we are accepting questions ahead of time. So please submit your questions if you have any related to that schedule so that we could use that time to to help you guys out with a new new schedule uh, 
And on the screen, we have the contact information from each state agency. Um, it has their, their phone number and their email address. Um, I know for OPWDD, we've been encouraging everyone to submit questions via email just because of the, we have limited staff going in, checking voicemails. Um, so it's, it's much easier for us to, to address the questions um, via email. SCD is one of the participating agencies on the CFR. However, they will not be represented at this training session. Therefore, any questions or concerns you may have with SCD related issues should be directed to your SCD contact. Uh, contact information for the New York State Aid Departments is as followed. Uh, OMH State Aid Department is 518-473-7885. Um, OASIS State Aid Department is 518-457-5553. And OPWDD State Aid Department is 518-402-4321. Uh, for New York State Office of Children and Family Services Providers, uh, they may submit questions regarding their CFR submissions to the OMH CFR unit. Uh, New York State Department of Health Providers may submit questions regarding their CFR submission by email to mhrs at health.ny.gov. Now I'll be uh, passing off the presentation to the next uh, presenter. Hello, uh, my name is Francis Vasalio. I work in the CFR unit at OPWDD. As Ken mentioned, we're going to, part of today is we're covering the manual. Too many people try to start their CFR by going directly to the program and trying to work with it without reviewing the manual first. The manual contains nine general overview sections. There's a section for each of the core schedules and the claiming schedules and the supplemental schedules. There are numerous appendices containing detailed information. For instance, Appendix G of the manual lists every program funded by OPWDD with information about what constitutes a unit of service and how you should um, format them on your CFR. The what manual itself and the appendix are available through separate downloads from the New York State Education Department website. And that uh, web address is listed at the bottom of your screen. This is what the New York State website looks like. Um, as you can see, it's not limited to the most recent manual and appendices. Uh, you can go back several cycles and uh, download to your computer um, or look them up online. The CFR is used for rate and fee setting by the various state agencies, as well as computing cost of living increases. And very importantly, it's used for fiscal analysis by not just the state agencies, but also the state legislature, the governor's office, DOB. So we work very hard to get you to complete the CFRs accurately so that we can look at the data as a whole. The state aid claiming schedules, which are the DMH2 and DMH3, which are part of the CFR, are your end of year state aid claiming documents, which are very important, I know, for many of you. When you are completing a full CFR, you must use full accrual accounting for the CFR 1 through 6 and the DMH1. The DMH2 and DMH3 could be completed on either the full accrual or modified accrual or a cash basis. And those of you who are lucky enough just to be filing a mini abbreviated CFR may complete all of your schedules that are required on with those options of full accrual, modified accrual, or cash basis.
there are four types of CFRs. There's the full CFR. Did I skip a page here? Oh, I did. Sorry about that. Methods of accounting. So when we talk about um, full accrual accounting, the we mean that when you earn the revenue, you record it at that time. Um, you may be providing a service in June. You may be billing the state or Medicaid in July. You hope to get paid by August. All that has to be included as of your June 30 CFR. Likewise, your expenses are recorded at the time that they're, um, re they're recognized at the time they're incurred, and so too the units of service. Salary expenses for your employees have to be recorded at the time they're earned by your employees, so not the date of the paycheck. So your quarterly payroll reports that you file, the numbers you report in those will not match necessarily the numbers that you report for salary expense in your CFR. There are four types of CFRs. There's the full, the abbreviated, the Article 28 abbreviated, and the mini abbreviated. The type of CFR that you're required to file depends on the type of programs that you're, are funded and the amount of funding that you receive from the state agencies. If you look at the manual, there are a series of matrices in Section 2, and you can go through these and answer a series of questions and that will determine whether or not, uh, what type of CFR that you have to file. The key is that if it turns out that you're required to file a full CFR for any one of the state agencies that fund you, you're going to end up doing a full CFR for all those state agencies because it's all reported in one CFR. Keep in mind that for OPWDD, if you receive $1 in Medicaid funding, you're required to file a full CFR. This, what you're looking at is one of the, is a matrix that where you go through, you answer these questions, you follow the arrows, that tells you not just the type of CFR that you have to file, but whether or not it has to be certified, what other schedules are required to be filed when you're completing the CFR. For the purposes of answering the questions in this matrix, if you're receiving Medicaid managed care funding, that's the same as receiving Medicaid funding. Reporting periods. The location of the headquarters of your organization determines when you're required to file a CFR. If your headquarters is in New York City, then you'll file a July through June CFR. If your um, headquarters is on Long Island or upstate, you file a calendar CFR. Some of you are going to be lucky enough to get to do this more than once a year. If you're located in New York City, but you have a contract to provide services in, say, Nassau or Westchester, then you may have to file a calendar CFR as well. But those are called secondary uh, submissions, and fortunately, um, we allow you to do a mini abbreviated CFR in those instances. The most common example of those is where you're in the city and filing outside, or for upstate providers, it would be if they received a uh, legislative grant, which uh, has to be uh, reported on a CFR with a June end date for OPWDD. Due dates. Normally, if you're OMH and SED, your due date for a June 30 CFR would be November 1st, and for OASIS, OPWDD, DOH, and OCFS, your due date would be December 1st. Because of what's gone on with the shutdown and the COVID virus, 
all CFRs for the June 30 period have been, uh, the deadline has been extended to January 1st, 2021. You do not have to apply for an extension. Everyone can file with a, keep in mind you have till January 1st. The due dates are very important. If you file your CFR late, you can be sanctioned financially. For OPWDD, which has the toughest sanctions, being one day late in filing your CFR means at least one month of 2% of all your Medicaid billings get withheld and you never get that funding restored. Um, that's why those of you who are responsible for the CFRs have to make sure that you have a plan in place to get your ledgers completed and to your accountants to produce financial statements in time for the financial statements to be reviewed by your board and accepted, to get your CFR produced and to your CPA so he can certify the CFR if that's required. And it all falls on you to have a plan in place ahead of time to be able to meet that deadline because you don't want to have to go explain to your board or to your bosses that you're being penalized significantly. In addition, the federal government has decided they're going to withdraw funding for agencies who don't meet the filing deadlines. So they've said anyone who doesn't file their June 30 CFR by February 1st, they're going to withdraw federal funding for that agency. And since half the Medicaid funding that we give you through your rates comes from the federal government, we're going to slash at OPWDD, we're going to slash your rates by 50%, which could put your agency out of business. That 50% uh, that, uh, penalty would take first place would go into effect August 1st and would remain in effect until the next year's CFR is filed. Let that soak in for a minute. That's how important these deadlines are. And with the pushback to January 1st for the uh, regular deadline this time, you, there's not a lot of time left in there between the time where that federal government 50% penalty kicks in. If you're also funded through an LGU contract with the city and you're going to file uh, according to the extensions, you should touch base with them and make sure that it's uh, permissible for them for you to be funding at a later time. It usually is not an issue, but you shouldn't take it for granted that it won't be. Submission requirements. If you go to the OMH website, um, the, you can see that um, the software is downloaded from there, and that's part of what is required. You have to file using this software. Um, this software applies for all the state agencies. It is also that, that web page at OMH is where you'll be uploading your software, it's where you can upload the financial statements, the certifications, the parent agency administration expense. We do not need you to mail hard copies of your full CFR to the CFR units in Albany. You just fill our recycling bins when you do it and you cost yourself some extra funding you don't need to spend. If instead of uploading the CFR, certification pages, you can still mail them to OMH hard copies. You can st still email them to OASIS and OPWDD. DOH and OCFS, if you're funded by them, you have to upload. Now it's to all of your agency's advantage to use the upload process because if you're funded by multiple state agencies, one upload will get distributed to each of the CFR units in Albany. You may still have to send something to your local office if you've got a contract they have to approve, but this one upload will take care of all the filings that are due in Albany. When you revise a CFR, 
you are always required to at least submit a new CFRI signed by the executive director. This is sufficient for revised CFRs for most of the agencies. OASIS uh, requires CFRI, I, III, I, and IV, um, or instead of going back to your CPA, they may accept an attestation signed by the executive director which lists the changes that have been made. You should contact them if you uh, are wanting to go that route instead of getting a new double I sign. If you're emailing your CFRs to OASIS or OPWDD, here again are the naming conventions you should use in your subject line. Once again, we'd much prefer that you use the upload process, which is found through the utilities function of the program, just like when you're uploading your financial statement or your CFR itself. With regards to financial statements, you only have to upload a financial statement one time, no matter how many times you review the CFR, revise the CFR. Now, the only exception to that would be if the accountant makes changes to the financial statement and there's a revised financial statement issue. Otherwise, one upload is sufficient. You can never upload draft financial statements. So that's why you have to give your organization time to conduct your board meeting to accept your financial statement prior to the deadline. Using the uh, CFR program, you can upload not just this year's financial statement, for, but previous years if for some reason um, uh, it wasn't submitted. We would prefer that your financial statement match your reporting period with the same beginning and end date. We know that's not always the case. And if it isn't for your organization, you have to upload a CFR, a financial statement with an end date that falls in that 12 month period. So if you're filing a June 30 CFR, you're and you may have a December 31st end date on your financial statement. Just make sure it's within that 12 month period. This is the web address where you're gonna to go to get the CFR program. And uh, you can Google that and go to OMH and then when you get to their website, you can look for CFRS and it'll take you to their uh, CFR web page. This one bit of software will take care of your reporting requirements for six different state agencies. Um, you don't file a separate CFR to each agency. It's one CFR, it'll include all the information for all six agencies, up to six agencies that uh, fund your organization. Um, you have to go in and put some information about your agency uh, into the CFR. Um, the program understands when you choose what reporting period you're gonna be filing, the program knows which programs were, the, the CFR program knows which funded programs were active during each period and which funding source codes were available and which job title codes were available. And you can actually use that program to go back and um, if you've got the latest version on your computer and you've gone back, you've been asked to revise a previous CFR, this latest uh, version of the program knows what was uh, in effect at that time and you can go back there and revise the CFR and, and resubmit it. The software is updated twice a year, the uh, once for the calendar and once for the uh, June 30 filers. Um, if you are one of those lucky agencies that gets to file multi uh, times a year, then uh, the latest version will allow you to go back if you have the June 30th and you have to go back and revise your 
many abbreviated December CFR, you can use this latest version for that. The version 35 of the CFR is what you will need on your computer in order to complete a June, a July 19 through June 30, 2020 CFR. Um, we're hoping to have that available in early October. The DCN or document control number is really the file number of the CFR data that you're going to be uploading to us. After you've completed your CFR and gone through the validation process, which is found in utilities, you will have a DCN assigned. It's a eight-digit number. It gets assigned to the file. Some people make the mistake of because the first thing they uh, address in the CFR are the certifications, they go ahead and print them as soon as they're finished before the DCN has been assigned. A certification that's sent to Albany that doesn't have the DCN on it that matches the file that you've uploaded is not valid. So make sure you pay close attention to the DCN. This is what the OMH web page for CFR looks like. At this web page, you can download the software, you can upload CFRs, financials, certifications, et cetera. There's a link here to the SED website where you can get to the manuals. And most importantly, there is the announcement mailing list sign up. The uh, announcement mailing list is what's used, let's say in October, we finished all our testing and we're ready to release the CFR. We don't need all of you calling us every day from October 1st looking for the latest version. So if you register through here, then you will get a email notification that the software is available. This is really important for a couple of reasons. Number one, believe it or not, we sometimes make errors in our CFR program, which require us to issue a patch to uh, take care of an error that's cropped up. If you have not registered with the announcement mailing list, then you won't get noticed that a new and improved version of the program has been released, which will take care of problems you might encounter. So rather than uh, banging your head on the desk because there's an issue there that we've already addressed, all you have to do is go to this website today and make sure that your email address is entered in here. There should be at least two people from every organization who have their email addresses registered because one of you might win lottery and not be here next year, and we want your organization to get notice of when the CFR is coming out. If once you've downloaded the CFR on your computer, and we recommend you don't download it directly to your server. This uh, program is designed to work best on an individual PC. Um, once you've downloaded it there, then if you're having trouble getting it to work or you think while you're working with the program that something, some functionality of the program is not working all right, you should call the help desk. Um, they can help you with computer issues a lot better than those of us in the CFR units can usually help you. Um, the, they don't answer questions there about what constitutes a unit of service or some other uh, policy-related question, but they help you uh, work out problems with your CFR program. And keep in mind that more and more agencies have contracted out and there are all these uh, walls put up uh, to protect your computers and sometimes those interfere with the functioning of the CFR program. So you can have your uh, computer consultants talk with these folks and sometimes they can get things resolved that uh, is probably beyond what you or I could be able to uh, 
work out ourselves. Some steps, some tips for you to make this CFR process easier. I know uh, every time we did this uh, presentation live, there were a significant number of you who had never done a CFR before. And if your organization follows some uh, tips here, it can make the process easier. You should uh, reconcile your general ledger and on a monthly and quarterly basis and make sure that your payroll and fringe benefits are signed properly. You may have staff splitting time between different programs or different program sites. It's a lot easier to keep track of that on an ongoing basis than waiting till the end of the year and trying to figure out where someone spent their time the previous March. Um, expenses and revenues should be monitored and compared to in case you've got approved budgets. Um, it's a lot easier to get a budget modification done if you see that your expenses are running way beyond what the uh, a budget had projected and it's easier to get that budget modified so you can get extra revenue if possible than it is to wait till after the end of the reporting period when you've already blown through your budget and then try to go back and get any extra funding. Um, try to set your ledger up in a way that matches the way you have to report. So if you can divide um, your expenses by program and in some cases of some programs by the sites that uh, you're operating the program, that'll make this a lot easier. Have the people who are uh, billing the state or uh, running your individual programs give you updated reports through the year about the units of service they've provided. If they're giving you a report of units of service that doesn't look anything like what you had in the previous CFR, it may be that they're calculating units of service incorrectly and it's better to have that worked out before it's time to actually do the CFR. You should also keep track of any non-allowable costs for your programs which you're incurring. In order for an expense to be reimbursable, it must be generally recognized as ordinary, necessary, and for the direct benefit of the client. So we have a list of possible um, non-allowable expenses in Appendix X of the CFR manual. Um, there, the way it works is if you've got an expense, and keep in mind that these expenses are not necessarily non-allowable according to the IRS or GAAP. They're just expenses that we at New York State are not going to reimburse you for. And the way that works is you would go ahead and report the expense on the appropriate expense line so that your total expenses match what your general ledger says. But then you also use the non-reimbursable, non-allowable line. For CFR 1, that's line 66. You would report that same expense then a separate, separate time on line 66. You would refer back to the line where the expense was reported originally. You would have the same uh, amount and the same description of the expense. And that way, when we review your CFR, we can see that you've acknowledged that the expense was listed and that it's non-reimbursable. Any costs that you have that are not related to patient care and are for the diversion amusement or entertainment of the owners or employees, like a big Christmas party, that's not usually reimbursable. If it's a Christmas party that includes your clients, that could be reimbursable. So keep that in mind, although we're never gonna pay for the booze that you serve at any party. Um, any fines or penalties that you incur uh, are not reimbursable. And another important category are related party transactions. You have to keep track of these because um, if the related party transaction doesn't meet certain requirements, and those are going to be covered when we review Schedule 5, 
CFR 5, then uh, those will have to be reported as non-reimbursable as well. Fringe benefits. Um, any fringe benefit expenses that you have that aren't available to all your employees. If you've got a special retirement uh, account for your executives of your organization that's not available to all employees, that's not going to be reimbursable. If you've got a 401k that all employees are eligible to participate in, then that is reimbursable. So you want to keep track of these non-reimbursable expenses as you go through the reporting period. And now it's time for me to hand off to the next speaker. And I think I've... Hi, this is Paul Green from Oasis. Uh, thank you very much, Francis. It is now time to do the CFR. If you were able to download the software successfully, you should have this icon on your um, on your screen. It should say version 35. If you double click on it, it should open up and you should be able to start working on your CFR. If it does not uh, open when you double click on it, uh, you could try right clicking and then select run as an administrator. It's a trick that works a good percentage of the time. You will not have to do it a second time, so it's just the first time. Once you do open it up, uh, you would have this screen, and it's going to ask you, what would you like to do first? Would you like to open a submission, create a new submission, or import data? Open a submission is a selection. If you were working on the CFR prior to launch, stopping for lunch, and then coming back after lunch and starting again. Create a new submission is brand new. Um, you're, maybe you lost last year's records or you're a new agency or something to that effect. Importing is what a majority of people use and what we recommend. It's the easiest way of doing it. Okay? So we will start with importing first. This is the screen that you will see when you select import data. From the top left, there's a drop-down box to find previous versions of the software. If you're creating a CFR now in version 35, then your last year's version was probably in 33. So you would select 33, then in the middle of the screen is the CFRs that are in version 33. You can select the one that you submitted last year, highlight it, okay? And that is the one you're going to import into version 35. Now, the question is, do you want to import all the data or master data only? Okay. All the data will be basically everything from last year's CFR will become the new CFR. Master data only will be programs, position title codes, addresses, executive director's information, but there will not be any numerical data, okay? Uh, master data only is what most people use. Then, right below that, you're going to select change submission definition because you're changing it from last year's 1819 to this year's 1920. Once you select change submission definition, go to the bottom left, you'll see submission type, provider ID number, reporting cycle, and then you're going to select the 1920 period. Now, it's not shown there yet because the software is not available yet. However, when you select 1920, you click Validate. It will say Successful, and then you click Import. Then you will have successfully brought your 1819 CFR into the 1920 uh, format, and then you can go in, make your changes, make your corrections, and, and that saves you a lot of time, okay? Uh, one last thing on this screen. If you did not save it on your CFR from last year, you're using a, I'm sorry, you're using a new computer from last year. If you saved it on a flash drive or something to that effect, 
So it's not going to be under version 33. It's going to be on a flash drive. So that's when you're going to use the browse uh, to find the flash drive to import it. Okay. So that was importing data, and from now uh, going forward, we're going to talk about creating a new submission. If you select create a new submission, the first thing it asks you is a submission type, state agencies you're involved with, provider ID number, period, and, re and uh, reporting period. These are the, this is the information you're going to need to complete this section, starting with the legal name. I realize a, a, a lot of you are hospitals, and sometimes you use abbreviated names. However, we do want your full agency name, okay? Federal ID number and president names of president, board of directors, and such is all required. This is where you're going to input all that information, okay? Uh, it's all self-explanatory. The one thing that needs to be remembered is over to the, to the right, Certified financial statement reporting period. Every year this has to be updated, and it's important. This is the period of time that the financial statements are based on. Once you have established the agency's information, then it's time to create program sites. Now, right below that highlighted option is update an existing program site. So if you do import, you can go back and make changes to them also. But we're going to start by creating a new one, and this is the information that you need. The types of program your agency operate, the four-digit program codes, the two-digit index code, the PRU number or program site identification, the county in which each program operates. This screen is a split screen. The bottom is where you're going to put in the information, funded by the agency, then the drop-down list for the programs, the index code, the site code, and such. For your convenience, this information will stay here once populated in case you have a second program to, um, with the similar information, such as address and such. However, once you've input this information and you click Save down at the bottom, it will flow to the top of the section of the screen, and then that will be added to the list of programs that your agency operates. Now, once you have a bunch of programs listed on the top, uh, such as OPWDD programs, OMH, and OASIS, again, the information has been saved down at the bottom. If you find that you want to change one of these programs, change the information, maybe the site name changed, maybe you've, uh, um, you've discontinued the program or such, you would go back to where it said to update a program site, and you would click on that, and then that would give you the ability to highlight the program you want to change and then change the information down at the bottom. Uh, you can also go to the utility screen and delete a program that way also. Once you have the, the agency established and the programs established, then it's time to begin the schedules. Okay? Um, for a full CFR, on the left hand of your screen, you start out with the signature pages and then you go into the individual schedules. This is a navigation. You, uh, it's suggested. It doesn't have to be filed, ex uh, followed exactly. You can jump around, but you do have to understand that the data from the CFR4 flows to the CFR1, and the data from there flows elsewhere. So this is the preferred way of doing it. Every time you are done with one and you hit save and go to, it'll bring you to the next one. The certification schedules are the I, the double I, the triple I, and the IV. These are important. Up until this point, you've completed the CFR, you've submitted it to us, but it's not worth the paper that it was created on until somebody signs off on it stating that it's, it's accurate. Okay? So we need certification pages stating that the, the report that you've submitted is accurate. This is a screenshot from the CFRI. 
you fill in all this information. If you're importing it from last year, you should, you should definitely go in and make sure that none of the information has changed. Make sure that the emails haven't changed and phone numbers and such. The first person is the contact courtesy title. That is generally the person that can answer questions regarding a CFR. Okay? That is the first person that the reviewer will contact if we have a question. The second section is the chief executive officer's information. All emails will copy that person. The third is the president, chair, board of directors. Okay. Uh, they would generally be copied on, on uh, emails also. And then finally, claims contact courtesy. If you have to complete this section and the information is the same as the fiscal contact in the first section, you can click on that button on the bottom left, copy contact, and that will carry all the information from the fiscal contact down to the claims contact. Again, this information is very important. This is where we're getting emails to uh, addresses to send out um, information to, so it should be checked and validated every year. The CFRI is required for all CFR submissions, which means if you upload a new submission due for, for revisions, you will have to submit a new CFRI to each agency associated with that CFR. Okay. The scheduled uh, signed CFRI must have the same DCN number of the CFR that you are uploading. Next is the CFR double I, the accountant's report. Okay. This is where you fill in the information, and it's required for most full CFR submissions. It's signed by an independent certified public accountant. Uh, it should be uploaded via the CFRS upload page, and it should have the same DCN number as the as the CFRI that was submitted by the executive director and of the CFR that was uploaded. Okay. For questions regarding this, you should see Appendix AA of the CFR manual. The question is whether to uh, print a CFR I or IIA. Okay, and that's where I asked you earlier to input put the uh, start and date time for your financial statements. If the start and date time for your financial statements is the same as the CFR reporting period, then a CFR double I should be signed by the CPA and submitted. If they are different, then a CFR double I A is what needs to be completed. Finally, counties and other municipalities have the option of submitting the CFR II, IIA, or a compliance review, and there's more information on a compliance review in Appendix CC of the CFR manual. The CFR III is only necessary if you're receiving uh, funding from a New York State agency, okay, either direct or local. If funded through a direct contract with the executive uh, direct contract, the executive director must sign the far left certification statement designated for voluntary local service provider. Okay, they would then uh, forward that on to the county, where the director of the community mental health services would sign the far right. If it is a county completing the CFR III, the county county treasurer would sign the, the middle section of the CFR III and then send it off to the director of the Community Mental Health Services to sign the far right. Uh, just so you, uh, a good practice would be once you have signed uh, as your executive director, once they've signed to the far left, and they send it off to the county to sign the far right, it might be advisable to send that copy to the state so that we know you have done what you were supposed to do. Okay. Finally, we have the CFR IV, Supplemental Attestation Schedule. 
The CFRIV was uh, newly enacted a couple of years ago, and it's all about the fiscal viability of your agency. It's a series of questions. When answered, gives us a heads up on how your agency is um, faring. Basically, the first question is, have you filed your most recently required federal tax form 990? The answer would be yes, no, or not applicable. Okay. If the answer is no, we're going to ask the follow-up question of when, what was the last 990 that was submitted? So each of the questions needs to be completed. What's important to know about this is it is um, signed by the executive director under uh, penalty of perjury. Okay? Therefore, this is something that actually, if it is proven to be uh, incorrect or fraudulent, the executive director could be penalized uh, criminally for this. So it is very important that these be filled out. Um, Section 2.14 of the CFR manual gives a little more information as to how often it needs to be submitted. Some agencies only want it once. Some agencies want it for every uh, electronic upload. Okay. Uh, but uh, the CFR IV is not required for SED only CFR filers, governmental service providers, or many abbreviated CFRs. So once you have completed these uh, schedules and you hit save, go to, it brings you back to the navigation box and it brings you to the next thing to be completed, the CFR 4. Here is the next speaker. Thank you. Good morning, this is Michelle Shalinski on OMH. Next, we'll be going over how to complete Schedule CFR for personal services. There are two sections of Schedule CFR 4. Report the personal services of your employees that work on the program, program admin, or local government unit admin. To complete the schedule, select the state agency, program, and site from the drop-down menus. Click the Add button at the bottom menu. Select the position title code, standard work week. Enter the annual hour hours paid for that position title and the annual amount paid, and the FTE will automatically calculate. Next, select the Agency Admin tab on Schedule CFR 4 and enter the personal services for your employees that are working in your agency's administration. Click the Add button at the bottom menu, select the position title code, standard work week, enter the annual hours paid and the amount paid, and the FTE will automatically calculate. An employee generally receives a W-2 from your agency. Employees working in your agency administration are reported on Schedule CFR 4 using the 600 level position title codes. 100% of the amounts paid for agency administration staff must be reported. The position title codes are listed in Appendix R of the CFR manual. The positions are listed with functional titles and they may not match the exact title of your employee. Some position title codes are specific to one agency. In this example, position title code 211, volunteer coordinator, can be only used for OASIS programs. Appendix R of the CFR manual details the position title codes. 
they are categorized by levels, beginning with the 100 level, going to the 700 level. 200 level is direct care staff, and 300 level is clinical staff. These levels are used in the rate rationalization process at OPWDV. If you enter a line that you would like to delete, highlight the row and click the delete button. The standard work week must be at least 35 hours, but not more than 45 hours per week. The hours paid FTEs and amount paid totals are shown by column. If you have an employee that is working in more than one program or a position, allocate that employee's hours and amount paid between the programs and position titles. The next slide details how to calculate an FTE. This is automatically done by the CFRS software. In this example, the agency has a part-time employee that worked 900 hours for the year in a position that would um, have, that had been a full-time um, employee would have been 1,820 hours. The ratio of 900 hours divided by 1,820 hours equals the FTE of 0.495. Once you've completed the Schedule CFR 4, the personal services total for the program's sites reported on Schedule CFR 4 transfer to Schedule CFR 1, line 16 for a full CFR. CMH1 line 6 for an abbreviated and Article 28 abbreviated CFR, and the agency admin administration personal service totals transferred to Schedule CFR 3 line 1 for a full CFR. Next, we'll go over how to complete Schedule CFR 4A, Contracted Direct Care and Clinical Personal Services. To complete the schedule, select the state agency, the program, and site from the drop-down menus. Click the Add button and select the position title code. Then enter the annual hours paid and the annual amount paid. Only contracted direct care and clinical staff positions are reported on Schedule CFR 4A using position title codes 200 level and 300 level. Contracted staff may receive a tax form 1099. As with Schedule CFR 4, the position title codes are listed in Appendix R of the CFR manual. The total contracted direct care and clinical personal services carries forward to Schedule CFR 1 line 35. Next, we'll go over how to complete Schedule CFR 1 program site data. Schedule CFR 1 is a core schedule and it is completed on an accrual basis of, of accounting. It is a schedule that is required for, for a full CFR submission. To begin, select the state agency, the program, and site from the drop-down menus. Data on lines 1 through 6 and 8 carry forward from the program site definition screen. Report on lines 7A and lines, line 7B, the Medicaid provider agreement number and national provider ID number for Medicaid eligible programs. The units of service for the program is reported on line 13. For OMH programs, that number transfers from 
supplemental schedule OMH1. It is critical that the units of service reported on this line are accurate. Inaccurate units of service is a reason that a CFR may be rejected. The units of service for a particular program reported on the CFR can be found in appendices E, F, G, H, double H, and double I. It is important to ensure that information is recorded at the time that the service is delivered. Next, select the Expenses tab in Schedule CFR 1. The following are the expense categories listed on Schedule CFR 1. Personal services, vacation leave accruals, fringe benefits, OTPS, equipment, property, and agency administration. The personal services carried forward from Schedule CFR 4 populate on line 16. On line 17, report the vacation leave accruals, the increase or decrease from previous year. Report mandated fringe benefits on line 18, such as unemployment insurance, insurance FICA, or New York State disability. Report non-mandated fringe benefits on line 19, such as health insurance, dental insurance, and pension benefits. Report the expenses of housekeeping, garbage and snow removal, maintenance and minor repairs on line 22. Report the expenses associated with participant entertainment, recreation, summer camps, clothing, on line 26, participant incidentals. Report the expense of non-adaptive equipment purchased in the reporting period with a value of less than 5,000 or a useful life of less than two years on line 28, expensed equipment. Report the expenses Report the contract and direct care and clinical personal services expense, which is carried forward from CFR 4A on line 35. Report the expenses of program supplies, medical supplies, printing, copying, postage, computer software on line 36. General insurance, such as general liability, bonding, professional and medical malpractice, vehicle, and other insurance costs related to the program and or program administration on line 39, general insurance. Do not report insurance expenses related to equipment or property, property on this line. Line 40 is the other line of OTPS. There is a line detail box on that line 40. Report expenses on the predefined line entries or add additional lines and enter a description and value of the expense. A common mistake that we find on desk reviews are that expenses are reported on line 40 other that are more appropriately reported on other lines. For example, in this screenshot, rubbish removal, an amount of $3,999 should be reported on line 22 repairs and maintenance. And printing expense of $1,227 should be reported on line 36 supplies and materials, non household. The OTPS equipment and property categories each have an other line for reporting miscellaneous, miscellaneous items. Information is reported on a line details box. 
and expenses greater than 1,000 must be entered with detail. Expenses less than 1,000 may be grouped together and entered in aggregate on a predefined line and treat all items less than 1,000 each. Do not report expenses on line 40 OTPS other that should be reported on another line, another expense line. Bad debt expense is reported on Schedule CFR 1 on line 40 and backed out as a non-allowable expense on line 66. Bad debt expense is not allowable throughout the CFR schedules. It is also reported on CFR 2 and CFR 3. More information about reporting bad debt expense on the CFR can be found in Section 8 of the CFR manual. Certain assets are depreciated on the CFR. Report vehicle depreciation on line 44. Equipment depreciation on line 45, building depreciation on line 51, and building land improvements on line 52. All items with an individual cost of 5,000 or more and a useful life of two or more years must be depreciated. Refer to Appendix O of the CFR manual for additional information on reporting depreciation on the CFR. Report non-allowable costs on line 66. A list of non-allowable costs can be found in Appendix X of the CFR manual. The amount of expense in excess of actual cost or fair market value for a related party transaction is a non-allowable expense and is reported on line 66. Report non-allowable expenses in the line detail box of line 66. To add a line, click the Add button, enter the line number of where the expense is reported on CFR 1 schedule, the amount of the expense under the Detail Value column, and a description of the expense. Line 68A, B, D and E are OPWDD informational lines only. If you are receiving funding in your Medicaid rate for to and from transportation expenses for the day treatment, HCBS day habilitation or HCBS pre-vocational programs, then these expenses are to be recorded in detail in program code 0670 and or 0880. Report on line 68A the transportation expenses other than going to and from the home and off and site and report on line 68B transportation expenses of going to and from the home and site. Report on line 68C, the portion of the total property expense of CFR 1, line 63, that is associated with program administration. Report on line 68E, day services liability for the ICF ID program. Any Agency operating an ICF must report the total billed to Medicaid by that agency plus what is billed to Medicaid by another agency for the day services provided. Next, select the Revenues tab on Schedule CFR 1. Report revenue received from program participants in excess of SSI and SSA on line 69, participant fees. Report the Medicaid fee for service revenue on line 72A and the Medicaid managed care revenue on 72B. 
reports accrued revenue from private health insurance on line 74, other third parties. Report the federal, federal grant revenue on line 79. And report the state grant, grant revenue received from New York State agencies other than the CFR reporting agencies on line 80, state grants. Report the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program funding for OASIS and OPWGD programs only on line 82. And report the prior period rate adjustments for OPWGD only on line 86. Net deficit funding is reported on lines 93 and line 103. Report the net deficit funding re received either through direct contract from a DMH state agency or through local contract from a local government unit, such as a county or city. Report on line 94, other revenue. Some examples include closely allied entity revenue for OASIS, safety net payments, and VAP Medicaid revenue for OMH, assistive supports revenue, revenue for non-Medicaid eligible individuals under predefined OPWDD state paid for OPWDD. Report on line 97, the provision for bad debts revenue deduction Report the provision for bad debt, provided that the revenue was not reported net of provision for bad debt on the CFR. The presentation of this provision for bad debt on the CFR should be consistent with the presentation of the provider's audited income statement. In other words, if uh, revenue is reported net of the provision for bad debt on the income statement, it should be reported net on the CFR. Bad debt expense is not reported on line 97. It is reported on line 40 of Schedule CFR 1, and it is backed out of the non allowable expense on line 66. There are other lines located in the revenues, GAAP adjustments to revenues, and non GAAP adjustments to revenues categories. Information is entered through a line details box. Revenue greater than $1,000 must be entered with detail. Revenue or funding less than $1,000 may be grouped together and reported on a predefined line while items less than $1,000 each. And this concludes this section. And here is your next presenter. Thank you, Michelle. Um, my name is Ken Glenmeyer, and I am representing OPWDD, and I'll be going over CFR 2 and CFR 3. So this screen right here represents a snapshot of what a CFR 2 looks like. Um, in this screen, uh, only column 9 is interable. Um, data from columns two through eight, they carry forward from DMH1. So if there is any carry forward information that is incorrect, it will need to be changed at the source schedule. Uh, column one is calculated by the so software. It's just the sum of columns two through nine. Uh, and then column one, lines seven, nine, and 10 should match the respective categories in your financial statements. There's a discrepancy between the CFR2 and your financial statements. It should be explained through the input on the reconciliation, which we'll go over shortly. CFR2 uh, captures is used to capture the total expenses and revenues that are attributable to the service provider as a whole. 
The CFR 2 is required for full and abbreviated CFRs filers only. It is not required for Article 28 abbreviated or many abbreviated CFRs. Um, totals for each New York State agency are displayed in separate columns, uh, and your agency's activities not inclusive of our programs are to be reported in column 9. Also reported in column nine are expenses and revenues related to fundraising events, uh, realized and unrealized gains and losses, uh, management services expenses provided to another provider agency on an ongoing basis. Uh, also the provider agency totals reported in column one will be compared to your financial statement totals. The reported periods are the same. Any discrepancies will need to be explained in the reconciliation. Um, Another note, uh, fundraising and fundraising special events are not considered agency administration expenses and cannot be reported on CFR 3. Uh, is it expected that the CFR reporting of fundraising and special events will match the reporting in your agency's financial statements? Uh, also, reported on here. Um, operating expenses reported on CFR 2 are used to distribute agency administration expenses between the CFR reporting programs. Um, some operating expenses include personal services, vacation, leave accruals, fringe benefits, and OTPS, less any raw materials. Uh, administration expenses are distributed based on the operating expenses reported on CFR 2. Side. Um, so, as mentioned before, a reconciliation statement is required if the there's differences in the between the um, differences between the financial statement and what was reported on CFR two, and the reporting period and the financial period are the same. So, a reconciliation statement is not required if the CFR reporting period and the financial statement period are different. Government entities, Article 28 abbreviated CFR filers and many abbreviated CFR filers are not required to complete this reconciliation. Um, for required reconciliation, the amount calculated as the difference in the worksheet should be less than $100 in order to pass validation. So this is a reconciliation, CFR 2 reconciliation statement for expenses. Um, line one, uh, report the sum of total expenses and total losses as reported in the financial statements. Uh, line two, this is additions, report the expenses and losses included in CFR 2 that were not included in the financial statements. And then line three, subtractions, report the expenses and losses included in the financial statements that were included in the CFR 2. The window on the right, um, the CFRS line detail will allow you to enter specific items. Um, and then it also allows you to put in a, a rounding in just case if you're off a few dollars as well. Next window, um, same situation as the expense side. So you would just click the tab reconciliation of revenues and gains. Um, same as uh, before, except for revenues, uh, line one. You just report the sum of total revenues and total games as reported in the financial statements. Line two is the additions. Report the revenue and gains included in the CFR that were not included in the financial statements. And then line three is the subtractions. Uh, report the revenues and gains included in the financial statements that were not included in the CFR. Um, common reconciling items may be reported as additions, subtractions in the reconciliation schedule or as such. Um, elimination of intercompany expenses and revenues, uh, depreciation differences, differing allowable depreciation methods, mes methods have been reported in the CFR and statement of activities expenses in the financial statements. Um, some other ones report any other item differences between the financials and the CFR that are not reported as adjustments, not allowable costs on CFR 1 or 3. 
and then a description should be added with any items here. And then, I'll, as, as I said before, rounding, any remaining difference between expenses reported on the financial statements and the CFR should be reporting on the rounding line. Next, uh, next page is about CFR 2A. So this schedule must be completed for all not-for-profit and proprietary providers when financial statements are required to be submitted. Is not required for Article 28 abbreviated filers, many abbreviated or governmental entities. Uh, this schedule is used to report data from your financial statements that were submitted in accordance with Section 2 and 6, and also data from the underlying year end adjusted accounting records that support these financial statements. The purpose of this schedule is to collect data in a uniform way in order to, for each state agency to have it readily available for provider specific fiscal analysis as well as industry wide statistics. Uh, instructions for completing the CFR 2A can be found in section 14 of the manual. This schedule, this, this shows what the CFR 2A looks like. Uh, this schedule requires specific items from the balance sheet and financial position. Uh, this information should agree to the financial statements provided with your su submission. Uh, the information is very important as it helps us with understanding the financial strengths and weaknesses of providers. And this continues on. Um, CFRs, the section 28, this should be the revenues and expenses for operating activities only. So what you are doing, what you are in the business of doing. This is generally a line item on your income statement of the financials. Um, other sections also include operating capital, this will provide us with detail of any line of credits your organization might have in outstanding balances, um, restructuring, or any conversion of debt. Um, debt management, are you meeting all your covenant, covenants? If not, do you have a waiver agreement from the, from the creditor? Um, and lastly, just a going concern question. Um, did the auditors indicate on your audit report that there was a going concern? concern? If yes, then um, mark yes here. The next schedule we'll be going over is uh, CFR, agency, CFR 3 Agency Administration. Um, agency administration consists of costs associated with the overall direction of the agency, uh, general record keeping and financial management, governing board activities, uh, public relations, excluding the costs associated with fundraising and special events, as we mentioned before. Uh, direct identification of specific expenses is the preferred method for charging expenses to various functions. Further, indirect costs are those activities or services that benefit more than one project or activity and may require to be allocated. In this case, the allocation method must be reasonable, consistent, and reviewed by management. Some examples include time study, square footage, actual use, and percentage of direct costs. Please note that Proper documentation should be retained regarding the methods used. Providers, they should consult the CFR manual, appendix I and K. Total administration costs for the entire provider agency are reported on a single CFR 3 schedule when completing a full CFR. Uh, note, abbreviated CFR filers complete the agency administration work, worksheet in lieu of the CFR 3. So this is required for CFR, full CFR filers only. And this is also an agency-wide schedule. CFR 3 is a three-tab data entry. So if we see the screen, it has personal services, fringe benefits, OTPS tab, uh, it has an equipment and property tab, and it has a ratio value tab. Um, similar to the CFR1, the agency must fill out the uh, schedule appropriately. Um, all you have to do is click on the different tabs to change to equipment, property, or ratio value. Some of the categories include uh, personal services, vacation leave accruals, fringe benefits, um, OTPS, equipment, property, and then parent agency administration allocation. Um, as pre previously mentioned, it is important to note again that fundraising and fundraising special event costs are not to be reported on CFR 3. 
they were to be reported in full on CFR 2, column 9. If parent agency administration allocation is reported on line 38, documentation of the administration allocation must be sent with the certification schedules. This includes, this must include total parent agency cost, total allocated cost to each of the subordinate agencies, and the basis used for the allocation. Section 15 of the manual was revised to provide additional guidance on reporting parent agency administration allocation on CFR line 38. Line six includes audit, legal, and accounting. So you would include the costs of other accounting services such as payroll services and CFR audit costs. Uh, line 14 would include contracted personal services such as management consulting services, IT support, and more. Um, this would include items with cost in excess of 5,000. Must be listed in the worksheets separately by description and amount. And then items costing less than 5,000 each may be aggregated and listed as all items less than 5,000. Costs to develop um, internal use software during the application development stage are capitalized and are not included on this line. So we would refer you to US GAAP codification of accounting standards topic 350-40 for internal use software or um, codification accounting standards uh, topic 350-50 website development costs to help you out with that. Line 16 just includes insurance, um, the general insurance. So this would include general liability, um, bonding, professional malpractice, vehicle, or other insurance costs related to the agency administration. Um, do not report insurance expenses related to equipment or property on this line. This represents the equipment and property tab. Um, the provider must fill out appropriately. And, and part of this tab, this includes, next slide, the OTPS and equipment and property categories each have an other line for miscellaneous items. Um, information is entered through the line detail box. Um, detailers required for individual items costing $1,000 or more. Individual items costing less than 1,000 may be grouped together as all items under $1,000 each. Note, if the total of the grouped items is, is excessive, you may be asked for detail, a detailed breakdown from a state agency. On line 41, um, this includes adjustments and non-allowable costs. Um, all agency administration items included on Schedule CFR 3, which are considered non-allowable expenses. Uh, if there are any administrative, administrative non-allowable costs reported on, on Schedule CFR 5, also include them here. Uh, the detail of adjustments to reported costs, the corresponding amount and the line number where the cost is reported must be entered in CFRS software's worksheet for this line. Refer to Appendix X. And please note that negative entries are not allowed on this line. And then line number 42, net agency administration, is in the amount to be allocated using the ratio value method. Right here is the ratio value tab. Um, all data elements are populated by the software, so you don't have to enter anything in here. Um, all calculations are performed by the software. Uh, calculated values are, are, are carried forward to CFR 1, 2, and DM, DMH 1. So the ratio of value allocation, uh, the total corporate agency administration expenses are allocated to all agency funding sources using the ratio value method. The ratio value method uses operating costs of the program sites as the basis of the allocation. Operating costs are defined as personal services, vacation leave accruals, fringe benefits, 
no TPS, less any raw materials. Schedule CFR 3 uses a two-step process to allocate agency administration costs. Um, the software actually completes all the calculations for you. That's helpful. The two-step process includes uh, step one, um, total corporate agency administration expenses from CFR 3, line 42, are allocated to each funding New York State agency. Operating costs for program codes 0880 and 0890 are excluded from this calculation. Um, those are uh, 0880 is some contract services and 0890 is local government unit administration. Step two includes uh, total corporate agency administration expenses from CFR 3, line 42. Um, they are allocated to each funding near, I'm reading, reading the wrong one. Second ratio value allocation is performed at the state agency level, exempting additional New York State agency specific programs. A list of the program codes not included in step two calculation can be found in section 15 of the CFR manual. The step two ratio value allocation is done within the New York State agency shares assigned in step one, allowing additional specified programs types to be exempted. Step two exempted programs are OPWDD program codes uh, 0190 and OMH program codes uh, 0860, 0870, 0920, 1230, 1690, 1910, 2740, 2850, 2860, 2980, 6910, 6920, 8810, and programs with an A program code index, and then startup. See the appendices for descriptions of these program codes. Um, the adjusted ratio of value factors are displayed on line 71 and 77, 71 through 77. This is the agency admin worksheet for abbreviated filers. Um, agency administration must be calculated using the ratio value method. Um, on this schedule, you would enter total agency administration expenses on line eight, and then the software does the rest. So the line eight is highlighted. And then agency administration uh, final thoughts. All agencies have agency administration expenses. Uh, agency administration expenses need to be distributed to all activities fairly. Ratio value is the required method used to allocate agency administration expenses on the core reports. Ratio value is based on operating costs. The amounts allocated may differ from the amounts allocated in your general ledger and financial statements. However, you may be asked to explain the difference upon review. In calculating expenses administration, administrative and overhead expenses, hospitals should use the most recent available allocation percentages from the step down derived from the last institutional cost report submitted to the Office of Health Systems Management as per Appendix Y. For uh, more information on the CFR 3 schedule, please see section 15 of the CFR manual. Uh, for more information on agency administration in general, I would direct you to section 42, appendix I, and then also please refer to appendix T for more information on how to calculate agency administration on an abbreviated CFR. Uh, thank you, and now I'll be handing off to the next uh, speaker. Hi, this is Paul Green from Oasis again. We've talked about the CFR 1, 2, 3, and 4 core reports. Uh, they are all connected. Very, uh, if you put a number on the CFR 4, 
it will flow to the CFR3, the result for that will slow, uh, flow to the CFR1 and also the CFR2. So they are all connected. However, the next two reports, the CFR5 and the CFR6, are standalone report schedules, okay? So if you put a number on a CFR5, it will not automatically flow anywhere else, okay? So CFR5, transactions with related organizations or individuals. It's required for submissions with full abbreviated and mini abbreviated, but not Article 28 abbreviated. The CFR 5 is used to report all transactions, including compensation, between the reporting entity, its affiliates, principal owners, management, and member of the immediate families. Um, and any other party with, with which the reporting entity may deal when one party has the ability to significantly influence management or operating policies. So there's two things being said here. One, there has to be a relationship between the parties. And two, there has to be the ability to significantly influence management decisions, okay? So um, an example of this would be if your agency was hiring a security firm uh, to watch some of your programs and your brother-in-law was the executive director of the security firm. So that would definitely be a related party as the brother-in-law could have an influence over your decision-making. Okay? However, if your brother-in-law was a, a lower-level position and actually had no ability to influence your decision, that would not be a related party. So related parties are important. Uh, you have to decide whether you have them, and if you do, you have to disclose them. If you need more information on this, there's more information in the CFR manual under uh, the CFR 5 section. There's also more information provided by agencies in their administrative guides. And finally, you can go to your financial statements because uh, related party transactions are generally noted in the uh, notes to your financial statements. Okay. The important part, it's, it's not a detriment to you um, in some cases it is, but it's not a detriment to you. You are allowed to do it. However, you are required to report them. Okay. So the first part of the CFR 5 is answering two questions. The first question, during the reporting period, were there any payments to a related organization? Okay. Uh, it's a yes or no question. If you answer yes, you have to complete sections B and C. B, possibly C, okay? If you answer no, then you go on to the second question. The second question is, during the reporting period, were there any transactions with related organizations or individuals from which the service provider received any financial aid or assistance or to which the service provider provided financial aid or assistance? So a good example of this would be a loan, a loan to the executive director or a loan from the executive director. So again, it's a yes or no question. If the answer is no to both these questions, then you are done with the CFR 5, and you can move on to the next uh, schedule. If the answer to yes, uh, the answer to the first question was yes, you have to complete B and possibly C. If the answer to question number two was yes, then you have to complete section D. So we will continue on as if the answer was yes, okay? So you had pay made payments to a related organization, therefore you have to complete Section B. And Section B is basically give us more information about this payment. Okay? So for the first one, it was Program 2100, and you leased space from this agency, and your amount of transaction reported, the amount of rent that you paid to this agency was $68,620. Okay? The second transaction is a different program, Program 0770, and it was salary and fringe paid to Sally Fields, okay? And you paid $10,200. So up to Column 7, that's how much you've paid. Now Column 8 and Column 9 is to determine if all of that expense was allowable or not. 
So we'll start with the easier one first. Sally Fields, you paid $10,200. If that is fair market value, if you could have hired somebody else to do that job for the same price, then that is fine, and the allowable cost would be the $10,200. Okay. If fair market value was only 8200 that's still fine. You can pay Sally Fields at 10200 but the allowable amount would only be the, the lower amount, which would be the fair market value, which would be 8200 And then there would be an adjustment in column 9 of $2,000. Okay? So, again, for salary and such, it's the, the rule is uh, fair market value. You're allowed to pay fair, fair market value. Property, the one above it, is a little more complicated. It's the lower of fair market value or the related party's actual costs. Okay? So, if you have a property um, cost, lease space or such, then you have to complete Section C. Section C is the related party's um, actual costs. Okay? So the related party had $10,000 of depreciation, $25,000 of mortgage interest, insurance, property, and other. Other could be maintenance, uh, landscaping, uh, sewer, uh, whatever expenses they incurred. The total, column 9, was 67620 Okay, You paid them rent of 68620 you're allowed to uh, deduct the lower of fair market value, which was 68000 or their actual cost, which is 67000 So in this case, the total allowable is 67000 and there's a 1000 non-allowable portion. Okay. Uh, what's important to remember is it's a standalone document. So by filling this out, you haven't actually deducted the $1,000. Okay. Um, so you have to remember to go back from the CFR 5 to the CFR 1, and you have to put in on line 66 an adjustment to lease of $1,000. Okay. So there's a lot written about this in the CFR manual. Again, you're, you're welcome to uh, do business with related parties, but when it comes to property, it's the lower, the amount that you're allowed to uh, expense is the lower of fair market value or the related party's actual costs. Okay? And you have to remember to go back to the CFR 1 and adjust out that amount. Okay? So that was all uh, regarding question number one. So the question number two, was there any... Um, uh, transactions of fiscal uh, to or from a related party? If the answer was yes, if there was a loan made to the executive director, you have to complete Section D, which basically is the name of the related party, address, type of funding, to or from, and funding amount. Okay. Um, again, this may not be... Uh, detrimental to your agency to do this, but it would be detrimental to not report that you were doing this. Okay. So that is a completion of CFR 5, all about related party transactions. CFR 6 is all about governing board and compensation summary. Okay. Uh, it's used to uh, complete it by service providers funding all CFR reported agencies uh, it is the reporting of compensation for the governing board members, uh, employees under the position title called 601, 602, 603, employees earning over 125000 and the five highest paid independent contractors earning over 50000 okay. It's required submission with full abbreviated CFRs, not for Article 28 abbreviated or mini abbreviated CFRs. The answer to question number one must be yes or no. So here's the question number one. Do any employees of your agency also serve on a governing authority? If yes, provide details of the employee's name and three-digit position title code. 
Okay. So if you select yes, a drop-down box will appear. You click add, and you can put in the employee's name and position title code. However, for most not-for-profits, the answer is going to be no. Your employees may sit in on the board meetings to stay, um, you know, abreast of what is going on. However, they do not have a voting right. Okay. So the answer would be no, and you would move on to section number two. Section number two is compensation paid to board members. Okay, If there is any compensation paid, you would list the name of the individuals who receive the compensation and the amount. Okay, Again, generally, not-for-profits do not pay board members. Uh, board members do this out of the goodness of their heart. Uh, the agency may reimburse them for ex uh, expenses, travel expenses and such, but that reimbursement does not meet the definition of compensation. Okay? If you are for profit, you may be completing these, these sections. Okay? So again, for not-for-profits, uh, most of you will say no, and you will move on to Section 3. Section 3, highest paid employees. So um, this is basically anybody that is reported under position title code 601, 602, and 603, regardless of their income. So even if the executive director only got $85,000 salary or such, it would still be reported here and all employees that receive a total annualized salary of uh, of 125,000 or above okay so this is a screenshot of the different uh, position title codes and such so the first one is a 601 executive director amount paid 260,000 with an FTE of 1 so they would definitely be reported because they're over the 125 and they're a 601 okay but then go all the way to the bottom, 603, they're only making 85000 with an FTE of 1. So it's below the 125. But again, 601, 602, and 603 need to be reported regardless. So that's that. Okay. Um, the only other one that's a tricky one is 604, Director of Division. They actually only made $112,000. Okay. However... What we're working off of is the annualized salary, and they only worked 0.85 of the year. If they had worked a full year, the annualized salary would have been 131,000, and that would have been over to 125. Therefore, they they would be reported. Okay, so this is important. Um, uh, again, it should be done. And the one thing, the last thing to remember here is column nine, other benefits. Okay. A non-allowable expense, such as an auto um, reimbursement, so the executive director has a, has a, um, an auto rented for them in order to commute to and from the office. It's a non-allowable expense. It's $1,200. It's reported here, but you have to remember this is a standalone document. So you have to remember to travel back to the CFR 3 and adjust it out as non-allowable. Okay. Um, if the executive director used it to then drive around to the different programs, uh, a portion of it probably would be allowable, and you would have to do a proration to back out the, comp, um, the commuting miles. Okay. So nonetheless, here in this case, it's all commuting miles. So on the uh, CFR 3, line 41, adjustment for non-allowable cost, in the detail, drop-down detail box, there's an uh, auto lease of $1,200. Okay. So in summary, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, the last section is Section 4. Section 4 is the five highest paid independent contractors. Now, this would be accounting, legal, medical, consulting, and such. Okay. Uh, if it's other, there's a drop-down box that you can type it in. The threshold for Section 4 is 50000 So if you have nobody over 50000 then you do not have to complete it. And if you have many, many 
over 50,000, you only have to list the top five, okay? Uh, independent contractors may be individual firms, individuals or firms. So that's the completion of the CFR 6, okay? The final core report, all this that we're talking about is the core documents, core schedules, okay? The final is the DMH-1. The DMH-1 is a summary of what you've done so far, okay? It's also a bridge to the claiming report. It's a bridge to the DMH-2. Okay? The DMH-1 has the ability to collapse um, categories and also to combine programs, if you like, programs of the same sort. So. If on the core report you reported multiple of the same program and you reported them with the same index code, 00, zero. so it's the same program, same index code, when it gets to the DMH1, they will be collapsed into one column. Okay. If you want to keep the programs separate, which OASIS requires you to do, we want all the programs that are reported separately on the, the CFR-1 to stay separate on the DMH-1. Therefore, you would use a different index code. You'd use 00 for program 3520-00, and then program 3520-01, and then program 3520-02. They would stay in three individual columns when they transfer to the DMH-1. Okay. So the DMH-1 allows you to collapse categories and combine programs. All right. It is, it works off the same principles as the CFR-1, okay? It's full accrual basis. Um, equipment costs of $5,000 or more must be depreciated. Agency administration is distributed between agencies by ratio value. So it's all the same concepts. This is a screenshot of it. If you're a full provider and you completed the, the CFR-1, this will all be grayed out. You won't be able to make any changes to any of these numbers. Okay? If you wanted to change the line 6, you did not like that, you would have to go back to the CFR-4 personal services for that program and make the change there. Okay? Um, so that's a screenshot of what it's going to look like. And again, you can see where line 9, other than personal services, where is that on the CFR 1 was over 30 lines of data. Now here it's, it's collapsed into only one line other than personal services. There are uh, line detail boxes to enter data. Uh, federal grants and state grants are two of the, of the lines that have drop-down detail boxes. You should keep, consider anything that has an asterisk to the left of the number is a drop-down detail box. Okay. These are program adjustments to revenue. Um, and they can be further explained in the, uh, the CFR manual. So once you have completed this um, and you feel confident that the numbers are uh, where you want them to be, then you are going to be done with the core report and you're going to begin the claim report. Okay? And the way to do that best is to click on that bottom left button, Transfer to DMH2. That will transfer everything from the DMH1 to the DMH2, and then you can go into the DMH2 and make adjustments accordingly. Okay. So only one last thing to say about the DMH1. If you are not a full provider, if you are an, uh, abbreviated or Article 28 abbreviated, this is your starting point. When you open a DMH1, all the lines will be white, which means they will be accepting input. Okay. So, again, a full provider doesn't make any corrections on a DMH-1. They go back to the core, uh, the other core reports. 
but an abbreviated or Article 28 abbreviated would start at this point. That is the conclusion of the DMH-1. I'm going to hand it back to Ken, the host. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you, Paul. Uh, I just want to, before everyone jumps off, um, I just want to thank you for participating in our first ever, you know, CFR training webinar. Um, but some items before you leave, just in case you missed the beginning of the webinar, um, please take time to fill out the post uh, post survey after you leave the event it should automatically pop up for you it'll help us make these trainings better going forward um, obviously the first one there might be some pickups or, or whatnot so just leave your uh, fill out the post survey and, and we'll review that and try to make the presentations better going forward um, and also uh, don't forget to I mean due to the current pandemic we added an additional schedule uh, labeled uh, COVID-19 um, after this webinar has been created, we would strongly recommend scrolling through the presentation to slide 296 and reading through the section. Um, on the third session this week, so this Thursday, we're encouraging questions to be submitted ahead of time. So the more questions submitted, the better we can make this um, webinar. So after this webinar, read through the section, submit any of the questions, you're going to submit them to OMH's email address, which is cfr at omh.ny.gov. So that's cfr at omh.ny.gov. Um, that'll help us, you know, make session three much better for everyone, especially since it's a new schedule. Uh, the more questions that we receive, the better the session will be. So on that note, I will uh, give you guys back some time, and I appreciate you guys coming to the session. And I'm sure uh, we'll see most of you guys tomorrow and also on session three. All right. Thank you very much.